Hi, I'm Gisela Ruckert, team leader of FairVote Kamloops. We've put together this short presentation to help you understand the choice that you'll be asked to make on this fall's referendum question, whether we want to switch from our current first-past-the-post voting system to a new proportional voting system. Towards the end of this presentation, I'll also be talking a little bit about the three system options that are given in the second question on that ballot. Fair Vote Kamloops is a grassroots, non-partisan organization, so we're not affiliated with any parties, and we are 100% funded by donations from the public. So, what do we know about this referendum? First of all, it's based on feedback from one of the most comprehensive consultation processes we've had in BC. Over 91,000 of us offered suggestions on how the question should be shaped and what criteria are important to us in terms of voting systems. Elections BC has already mailed out the voter's guide, and if you haven't received your ballot package, I'm sure you'll be getting it soon. They must be returned by mail to Elections BC by November 30th. They'll be going out to all registered voters, so make sure you're on the voters list with Elections BC online. If the first question results in more than 50% support for a shift to a proportional system, the new system will be in place for the scheduled 2021 election. And any riding boundary changes that are needed as a result of the referendum result would be completed by an independent boundaries commission, the same as always. Additionally, we're being assured an opportunity to review the decision that we're making by having a new confirmatory referendum after two elections using the new system. And this is what the ballot looks like. You can see that it's a two-part ballot. Question one offers a clear choice between the current first-past-the-post voting system or a proportional representation voting system. Question two allows voters who want to engage further an additional opportunity. We can rank three proposed systems in our order of preference. Both of these questions are optional, so you can choose to answer either one or both. And question two only comes into play if question number one achieves more than 50% support for the proportional representation option. Otherwise, the results of question two are moot. So why does this issue keep coming up? The answer is because awareness is growing that our current system has some pretty serious shortcomings and many people see proportional representation as a reasonable solution to some of the problems like the ones that are listed on this slide. As we move forward with the comparison of first past the post and proportional systems, I'll be using data and it comes from peer reviewed and published academic studies not studies which are published by think tanks, which might have their own agendas. The summary of evidence is available on our website at www.fairvote.ca. Just look for the document called Summary of Evidence. So let's start out with what many people consider to be the most serious problem under First Past the Post. Of all the ballots that are cast, only half of them actually serve to elect someone. So fully half of the voting population's preferences are not reflected in the final outcome. Instead of providing an accurate reflection of what people wanted, our voting system funnels it down to what half of the voting population wanted. And when we look closer at the votes that didn't elect anyone in BC, we can see that they're pretty evenly distributed amongst the major parties about 300,000 votes each for the BC Liberals, the BC NDP, and the BC Greens. And that's why we can claim, with justification, that electoral reform is not a partisan issue. It's an issue of voter representation. The normal trend, both provincially as well as nationally, is for one party to win 30 or 40-something percent of the vote, which, through first past the post, translates into more than half of the seats. We geeks call that a false majority. Proportional representation corrects this distortion and provides an accurate reflection of what voters wanted. First past the post also exaggerates regional differences. The rural-urban divide that we often hear about is largely a product of first past the post. The actual difference in voting patterns across regions isn't very striking. 
But small changes in popular support for a party can mean big differences in power. As a result of our system, entire regions find themselves basically shut out of power. The entire interior of BC has no one to speak on our behalf on the government side of the house because all of our MLAs are locked into opposition for four years. The tradition in BC is for the government side to completely ignore the opposition when it comes to policy decisions. Finally, under First Past the Post, we tend to see a lot of policy swings, with each new government undoing rather than building on the work of its predecessor. It's inefficient and it's a waste of taxpayer dollars to be reversing policy every few years. But even more importantly, policy uncertainty makes business investment riskier. Large investments want a guarantee of stability beyond a four-year electoral cycle. Since voters rarely give a party more than 50% support, it's happened only once in BC since 1956, parties are forced to work together under proportional representation. Our opponents will say that minority or coalition governments don't get anything done, but the evidence doesn't support that claim. Proportional representation tends to result in better long-term planning because politicians are working together, cooperating, and coming to a consensus. Having diverse perspectives at the table enables lasting decisions to be made on crucial issues. And we've seen exactly this happen in Canada when we've had minority governments at the federal level. Policies like universal health care, old age pensions, student loans, things like the Canada flag, all these policies have stood the test of time and as a result have come to define the Canadian identity. They were all brought in under minority governments. Countries using proportional representation tend to outperform us on a broad range of indicators. First off, they tend to be more fiscally responsible, and this comes as a surprise to many people who haven't read the research. A dramatic illustration of the difference in fiscal performance can be seen by comparing Alberta and Norway over the past several decades of the oil boom. Countries using proportional representation also tend to outperform us on health, education, and environmental indicators. All of which helps explain this next slide. Every time a neutral body, nationally or provincially, has been tasked with looking at electoral systems in depth and making a recommendation, they've come to the same conclusion. We should move to proportional representation. Proportional representation is the most common way that governments are elected around the world. The only major Western democracies still using first-past-the-post exclusively are Canada, the United States, and parts of the UK. And we have a recent example to guide us in terms of what it might look like for Canada to switch to proportional representation. New Zealand is very similar to us culturally and economically. They adopted proportional representation in the 1990s, and a confirmatory referendum held in 2011 showed more voters supporting the current system than voted for it back in 1996. That's a pretty strong endorsement. Maybe the biggest difference that voters would notice is that nearly all of us would have at least one local accountable MLA who we voted for and who shares our views and values someone we can approach with our concerns and know we will be listened to. The number of votes that actually goes to elect someone is around 95% in a lot of proportional representation countries. Compare that with our current 50%. I'd just like to talk very briefly now about the three systems choices on the referendum ballot. All three of them incorporate the key criteria which was identified by the public during the consultation process. So they would all provide local or regional MLAs. The ballots have room for local candidates' names on them, not just parties. No region would have fewer MLAs than now. This is guaranteed explicitly in the report. And there would be a maximum of eight new seats over the current 87, but only if they're needed for the system. As well, we've been guaranteed a 5% provincial support threshold 
to mitigate fears of fringe parties being elected. So let's have a look at the first system that is on our ballot, dual member proportional. Under dual member, two neighboring ridings would be merged into a single two member district. The largest rural ridings in BC would be exempted from this process and remain single member districts the same size as now. But for most of us, instead of having small ridings each electing one MLA, we'd have a double size riding jointly electing two MLAs. And parties could run either a pair or a single candidate in each of the dual member districts, depending on their level of support. Voters would mark the ballot with a single X beside the party of their choice. The first seat in each riding is won by the primary candidate of the party that receives the most votes, just as now. The second seat takes into account both local and provincial results to create proportionality. Usually, the second seat would go to the primary candidate of the party that gets the second most votes in the riding. The second system on the ballot is called mixed member proportional. Of the three, this is the most commonly used around the world. It's used in New Zealand, Scotland, Wales, and Germany. Under mixed member, voters elect a mix of MLAs, local and regional. So we would all elect one local one, just like now, plus we'd have a team of regional MLAs to make the overall results proportional in each region of our province. 60% of MLAs would be local, and 40% would be regional. The most common way to do this is to have two votes on the ballot, one for a local candidate and one for a regional candidate. You can choose the same party, but you have the option of choosing a different party as well. Voters end up with a team representing them, which means that almost everyone would have at least one MLA who aligns with their own views. The third system, Rural-Urban Proportional, offers flexibility to respond to the different geographies and population densities around the province. Variations of this system are used in some Scandinavian countries. This system allows different areas of the province to vote using different methods. In lower population density areas or rural areas, mixed member proportional, the system I just described, would be used. So again, voters would typically have two votes, one to elect a local candidate, just as now, and a second one to elect one or more regional representatives. So we get not just one, but a team of representatives in each region. In urban areas under the rural-urban option, several ridings would be merged, and voters would elect multiple MLAs using the single transferable vote, the system that was recommended for us by the Citizens' Assembly in 2005. Elections are done using a ranked ballot, so voters can mark as many choices as they want. They could just mark a single X or a 1, or they can number their choices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through the ballot. This system works well in urban areas where ridings are densely populated but quite small geographically, so the size of the merged riding is manageable. Voters are again represented by a team of MLAs, and almost everyone would have an MLA who shares their views. This is a system that offers maximum choice for voters, allowing choices among several members of the same party. So here's a quick summary of what we've just heard about the three systems. Under dual member, two neighboring ridings become one two-member riding, which elects a pair of local MLAs. Under mixed member, voters elect a team of MLAs, one local representative plus a few regional ones. Under rural-urban, two systems are used depending on the, density, the population density in the area of the province. So in urban and semi-urban areas, several existing ridings are merged into a single district and voters use a ranked ballot to elect the same number of MLAs collectively. In rural parts of BC, we would use mixed member. So we'd have a local MLA plus a few regional ones. And to give you a practical example of what the results of a proportional system might look like in our area, we've prepared this graphic. 
And this is purely meant to illustrate the concept. This is not a suggestion from Elections BC that the five ridings around Kamloops would necessarily be merged in this way into a region. But if we look at the five Kamloops area ridings in the last election, about half of us supported one party, the BC Liberals. But all five ridings went BC Liberal. Under a proportional system, we could expect to see more diversity in our MLAs to reflect the actual voting patterns. So if the last election were done under mixed member, we would likely have elected three local MLAs who would all be Liberals because they are the single largest party in our area, but we'd also have a couple of regional ones from the other parties. So the 50% of voters who currently feel unrepresented would also have an MLA to turn to. And by the same token, Liberal voters in areas like Vancouver Island would also have a rep who shares their views. And if you're interested in exploring systems in a little more depth, you might have fun filling out this quiz at www.referendumguide.ca. It provides a series of questions that let you choose between Scenario A or Scenario B, and it weights the options that you choose and provides you with the result that most closely aligns with the values that you've stated. Finally, before I wrap up, I want to stress the importance of getting accurate information from neutral sources. What's different this time from previous referendums is that the parties are not neutral. So while the issue of voter representation itself is nonpartisan, it's becoming increasingly difficult to separate out the partisan interests. But bear in mind that those who have benefited from the distortions of the current system may have a vested interest in keeping the status quo. So when you hear arguments against proportional representation, I encourage you to consider the source and use resources like the Elections BC website or this Pro Rep Fact Checker to test the claims that you're hearing. So here we are. There's a few more resources for you on this slide. The bottom website is the Fair Vote website where you can find more information on comparing first past the post and proportional representation, as well as more depth on the systems options that I covered very briefly here. I encourage each and every one of you to mail in your ballot after you've done your research, and I hope that you will choose to go with the evidence which is consistent and compelling in favor of proportional representation. Please contact us if you have any questions. Thanks.